We're almost to the end of Mark 10, and starting in Mark 11, we get back into the Passion narrative, and Jesus heading off to um, Jerusalem uh, and uh, the following of, of that story of his trial. So we're really at the end of, of the ministry part of Mark, the middle part. And you'll notice that it's the same pattern we've seen a couple of times now in the last few chapters of 8, 9, and 10 Mark, where Jesus predicts his death, where the disciples don't want to hear it or they don't understand it. And then they get into some kind of, of ridiculousness about um, who has power, who has earthly power. And Jesus kind of has to stomp that down. And then there's a situation where um, a healing happens or a teaching happens. Uh, children are brought up a couple of times. Um, so there's nothing essentially new in this uh, particular passage this week. It's still talking about the vulnerable. It's still talking about Jesus dying. It's still talking about being a servant leader. We've talked about that the last number of weeks. So I want to invite you with me this morning to go down a bit of a rabbit hole because one of the words that's very unique in this particular verse is the word ransom. It's right at the end. And the word ransom only appears in the New Testament scriptures and the Christian scriptures three times. One in this passage of Mark, one in a similar passage that tells the same story in Matthew, and uh, a reference to, to in Timothy. That's it. But if you look at the Hebrew scripture, ransom is a very important word. It's a very important concept. And we have to remember that Jesus is never not Hebrew. He is always a Hebrew man in his context. And taking the sense of um, Jesus' teachings out of the Hebrew tradition has gotten Christianity in a whole lot of trouble over the years. We, we've taken Hebraic concepts, plunked them into Greek philosophy, given them Roman structure, and we kind of got away from things. So let's kind of get into that rabbit hole, delve into what it means to ransom in the Hebrew context, which is probably what Jesus was talking about. Ransom is, you know, I mean, we're used to the word ransom in, in movies and stories. Like someone is kidnapped, someone else pays the money, they get free. It's that basic concept uh, is what we're looking at in the Hebrew scriptures. But we're looking at it in a matter of God providing the salvation, the, the, the ransom, the redemption, the whatever word you want to use. And you'll notice that all of these are heavily used words in Christian theology, which come with a great deal of somberness and, and um, ultimately atonement, which is, is what word we're going for. But in the Hebrew context, there's a lot of ways people actually pay the atonement price themselves. In the Hebrew tradition, there's a, a celebration, a feast day called Yom Kippur, which is literally the Day of Atonement. Although Kippur is better translated as Day of Cleansing, Day of Resetting Everything. And the concept is in the Hebrew tradition is that on that day, Hebrew people and the Jewish inheritors of this tradition fast and they recognize their faults, their sins, and they do something to make atonement. They, um, they make peace with, with their neighbors. They make a contribution um, to the temple they, they, or the synagogue. They do something to go through the, act, the penitential act of, um, of atoning. This is an act of ransom in the Hebrew tradition. And if you go a little bit further into it, there's a whole system of what ransom and atonement and redemption looks like in the Hebrew culture. There's a lot of rules about it. That if um, a man sells himself into slavery, he can be redeemed through the community once or twice, but never a third time, because he did that to himself. However, his children can continue to be redeemed by the community. People are told, if you have a pot of money, don't use it to pay for the synagogue first. Pay for redeeming people. Um, that you should never give away more than a person is worth. And by worth, we're not talking about the spiritual worth, but by the actual hard, cold currency used for enslavement. So the redeeming price, the atonement price, the kapoor, is the ransom is essentially what you cost on the market as a slave. So the wisdom is don't ever pay more than that because it will encourage the kidnappers or the enslavers to go at it even more if they think they can make more profit. 
Uh, this is the the rationale behind um, if you have if you're waging war and you have two of your um, uh, enemy soldiers and they want to ransom for one, that's that's not an equal exchange. Um, equally, if they've got two of your folks and you've got ten of theirs, ten for two is not an equal exchange. So you don't do that. They've also got a system of values. Women were redeemed before men were. Scholars were redeemed before priests, before parents, before families. Someone who was considered very intelligent was redeemed before someone who's considered more of a dullard. So there's this whole system of checks and balances that come into the, the process, the Hebrew process of redeeming, of redemption, of ransom. So that was probably going through the minds of the first century that was hearing Jesus use that word ransom, which is a very specific cultural reference that we need to tap into. And the other part of that, for our theological purposes, is ransom also meant to cover. So to cover, cover the cost of what someone meant, but also to uncover. So you were both covering and revealing what was the value of the person. So all of these complex meanings were put together. And then when we pull that into Jesus' message of being a slave, a servant to others, we have to draw the distinction between enslaving and intentionally putting yourself as a servant. If you are enslaved, it means someone else has power over you. You don't have any choice. So you are not able to make your service an offering because you are forced to do it. So Jesus is not talking about enslaving people. He's talking about becoming, lowering yourself. Those who are mighty, lowering themselves to be the servants of others. And when the ransom comes in that Jesus ultimately is paying, it is to cover the cost of what we have lost. Uh, one thinker I was looking at said, essentially, when you look at the Garden of Eden situation, People kidnapped themselves from God. They thought, we thought, we were smarter, more powerful, more able to make decisions, more able to control what happened in our world. And we lost the game. We lost the message. And through Jesus' life and death, God basically kidnaps us, pays for that kidnapping and brings us back to the world God had created us for us in the first place. So it's not like we're being paid for, um, or Jesus' life is being paid for this big, big boogeyman of sin or the devil. And, and again, this is an example of taking Hebrew thought and putting it into Greek philosophy that comes up with this idea of sacrifice and of um, paying for sins and all that stuff that really didn't have anything to do with the original Hebrew intent. So this idea that we are, that Jesus is offering his life. It's a voluntary gift. It's not something being demanded of him. It's not something being asked. It's not something to pacify a, a, a negative and, and a hateful God who wants to punish people. None of that's going on. It is this notion of ultimate providing, ultimate giving of yourself to cover the debts, the, the sins, the mistakes, the missteps that others have made. So they are now free to be part of the community that God has created. So it's really important when we're looking at scripture to look at where the words come from because it changes so many of our assumptions of Jesus sacrificing himself have to do with medieval thought. They're, they're not scriptural based. But if you look at the actual words that the first century was using, we can have a richer understanding. God did not ask Jesus to forfeit his life in payment to cover the sacrifices of our sins. That isn't what happens. Jesus voluntarily offers himself as a substitute going into the, um, the darkness, really, the, the sin, the servitude, so that we are freed to follow where God wants. And the ransom, that, that exchange, is totally useless if we do not accept what it means and move forward in the spirit for which it was offered. 
you'll know what the scripture says, the ransom for many. It doesn't say the ransom for all. Because some people will refuse to accept Jesus as the ransom. They're quite content in their world of, of greed and power and self-sufficiency and complete conviction that they have all the answers or can get all the answers. And we're not going to get into a save damn kind of thing because that's not part of Hebrew thought either. The whole idea is that we accept that Jesus was willing to trade himself for us. And our part of that exchange is now carrying on where Jesus would have been in the lead in the ministry. It's now our job to take up his role and keep going. The action, the physicality, the, the trial, the crucifixion, that all kind of comes together in a very awkward kind of jigsaw puzzle that where the pieces do not quite fit. So don't look for some simple conclusion and, and to take a metaphor for far too long because it won't fit. Jesus was on trial. Jesus was executed for political reasons that were outside of, yet connected to, his teachings. He taught of a new world. That was a threat to the people in power. He exchanged himself so that we would give up power and carry on the ministry. Those who love their power, they're not giving anything up. They're not accepting that ransom or the sacrifice. So we have a choice, as with everything that Jesus has ever taught us. We have a choice to accept that exchange and carry on, or to not accept the, the exchange and go on with our pursuit of worldly goals. It's a different theology, isn't it?